morning, and I'm glad you're here today. Amen. If you have your Bibles, uh, if you would, just open them up anywhere. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's turn to John chapter 3. Um, we'll begin at the verse 28. You can stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. John 3 and 28. It says, Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because the bridegroom's voice. This is my, this is my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. And then verse 30 is our text verse. He must increase, but I must decrease. Today I want to just preach on that thought. He must increase, but I must decrease. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask tonight today that you would please help me to communicate effectively, passionately, and with the anointing of the Holy Ghost on my life. This morning, I pray that every heart and every life would be changed for the better because they came to church today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I was asked uh, recently, uh, well, what's the big deal about going to church? You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And uh, I said, you know, you're right. You don't have to, you don't have to go to church to to become a Christian, but um, there's a lot of voices today telling you a lot of things about how to live your life and uh, decisions, how you're supposed to make them and come to them, and uh, a lot of those voices cannot be trusted. Can somebody say amen? It reminds me of a joke I read this week about the teacher to elementary students she said, uh, I guess she was trying to make some kind of point. She said, is, is anybody stupid here in this class? If you're stupid, stand up. And the kids, nobody stood up. And the teacher said, you mean in this whole group there's nobody stupid? If there's anybody stupid, stand up. And she waited a second. And little Tommy stood up. And she said, so you think you're stupid, Tommy? He said, no, ma'am. He said, I just didn't want you to be standing alone. <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? John the Baptist here, and I didn't find the scripture, the reference to it, but... Obviously, we know what Jesus' opinion of John the Baptist was. When John sent his disciples to Jesus in his latter years, he was in prison, and he was down, and he was wondering, did we, did we do the right thing? Is this the Christ? And he sent his disciples and asked uh, ask him, Are thou he, or should we look for another? And Jesus told them, uh, you know, all the, you go tell John all the things that you've seen. And uh, that the, he, the, the blind can see and the lame can walk, and that the, the poor have the gospel preached to them. And he sent his, John's disciples back to tell John that. And then Jesus turned to his disciples and he said, He said, Let me tell you something about John. He said, There wasn't one born a woman that was better than John the Baptist. That was Jesus' opinion of John. And uh, John. Here, the, the setting if you, in John chapter 3 is that Jesus, uh, I mean, excuse me, John had been the forerunner to Jesus' ministry. He was a voice crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And he preached repentance and people would come and, and uh, to be baptized of John and John, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. And people would come, and, and some people he knew they weren't living right, and so he'd send them away. He said, you need to go back, and you need to make some things right, and bring me back fruit, 
meet for repentance. In other words, proven that you've, you've tried to repent and make things right, and then we'll baptize you. And he preached baptism. And uh, the popularity of John had grown exponentially. Not with the religious crowd, but with uh, the common man. And that they went out in the, to the, by the droves to see him in the wilderness. And uh, we know that Jesus, um, when the, when the uh, Pharisees came to him one time and they said, uh, tell us by whose authority you do this miracle. And Jesus, and I'm just laying the foundation that, that John was popular, Jesus said, oh, well, let me ask you a question. John's baptism, from whence was it? And then they began to reason within themselves, and they said, well, if we say it's of man, then the people, we're going to have an uprising of the people because they are convinced that John's a, a prophet. And if we say it's of God, then he's going to tell us, well, why wouldn't you uh, believe it on him? And so it just established the point that John had had a, he had, he had became a great following to John the Baptist. And he was a popular, popular figure. You've got to understand that God had, there had been nobody for 400 years come on the scene and say, thus saith the Lord. John was the first one to break that silence. We call them the great silent years. Uh, from the end of the old covenant to, to the, the precursor of Jesus coming. John was that forerunner. And he had gained popularity. Well, one day, John, this is a little after John uh, had, Jesus had come to John to be baptized, but his disciples came to John, the disciples came to John, John's disciples, and said, he said, Lord, he said, there's, uh, Master, there's one, or they called him Rabbi, they said, there's one over here that's baptizing more than you're baptizing. What do we need to do about this? And then John the Baptist he, he goes through this, this dialogue that we just read this morning that uh, the bridegroom, uh, oh, I'm happy to hear the voice of the bridegroom. And then he says, he must increase and I must decrease. I was reading something and studying for this message. Uh, a guy said that your role cannot get mixed up with your reward. Your role cannot get mixed up with your reward. Meaning that John the Baptist had a role to play in the salvation of man. He prepared the hearts of the people for Jesus' coming. But he was not the main attraction. Jesus was the main attraction. I mean, and when people get to feeling like that their role is the most important thing, there can be a, a, a letdown when the main attraction gets there. But if we can keep it in perspective that Jesus is the main attraction, He's the one that we're looking to be with in eternity. He's the one that we're going to... He's the fulfillment of our joy. To be in His presence is the longing of our soul. And so in, in essence, even to every life here today, we know that this was a very practical uh, message and that He must increase and I must decrease. John was saying His ministry has to take the lead now and my ministry is a support role where I was, I was bringing people and I was leading up to now he is here and uh, he's the main attraction. And so we realize that that was the context. But the application for you and me today is the same. He must increase and I must decrease. That's a powerful message right there. The word increase. To increase means to make greater. As in number, size, strength, or quality. To make greater. To make greater. Now if you would turn with me to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. Colossians 1 and 15. The Bible says, Who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, 
the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now that word preeminence is not a common word that we use today. Uh, I looked it up and it means eminent or to be above or before others, to be superior or surpassing. Jesus Christ is to be superior or surpassing all others in our lives. Amen. Now this word or this verse, he must increase, but I must decrease, it implies a progress. Right? The word increase implies that you had this much, but you need to have this much, and the difference between this much and this much is the increase. So here's my message this morning. When you got saved, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you got a certain amount of Christianity. You got enough faith and you got enough uh, born again power to get you to heaven right then and there. Amen? But that does not mean that you got the full load. That does not mean that you've reached perfection. That does not mean that you are, you are now complete. There is an increase that needs to begin to take place in your life. Can somebody say amen? amen? So our faith needs to be growing and our love for the Lord needs to be growing. In Matthew 13 verse 31, the Bible says, Another parable put, to, put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a grain of mustard seed, which when a man took and sowed into his field, which indeed, hear this, is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs. Because the tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. And another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which when a woman took, she hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leaven. In other words, small things need to grow into big things. Small good things need to grow into big things, right? I may have to do something dramatic today to wake you up because I know that thus far the message is a lot of foundation. But here's the point, brothers and sisters. Just because you gave your heart to Jesus, you have now entered into a lifelong love affair with Jesus. Amen. And your responsibility is like with any relationship, you have to put the work into it in order for it to grow. He needs to begin to increase. And that does not mean uh, just for the baby Christians. That's, that's to the ones that's been, say, 40, 50, 60 years. All of us are at one level, wherever it is. But there's room for Him to increase in our lives. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. There is... I, I just kind of wrote this little saying here. Uh, and I hope it sets a foundation in your mind. There's only so much room in life. And there's only so much oxygen in the room. And there's only room for one to be in charge. There's only so much room in a life. You're not going to get it all done, friend. You're not. You're not going to do everything that you had set out to do. There's only so much room in a life. And there's only so much oxygen in a room. You ever been in a room with people that they just used up all the oxygen? <laughs> huh? I mean, it was all about them. I mean, they couldn't shut up. They couldn't. They, not, I mean, you wanted to say something, but there was no pause. I mean, you're thinking to yourself, this person, they're a genius. They have created the longest sentence in, in the universe. There's no pause. They, they forgot about commas and pauses. I mean, they just, they're just spilling out information. They've used up all the oxygen in the room. You know what happens when, when you get in a room with somebody like that? You need to breathe. 
And then there's only, there's only room for one to be in charge. My dad has a saying that anything, whether it be a company, a family, a church, anything, there's only room for one head. Anything that does not have a head is going to die. And anything that has more than one head is a freak. That's his saying. Amen. Jesus said it like this, No man can serve two masters. Either he'll love the one and despise the other, or he'll hold to the one and reject the other. No man can serve two masters. So what needs to increase about Jesus in our lives? Number one, his government. In Isaiah 9 and 7 it says, Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom in, to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice. From henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus said when you pray, you're supposed to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is something that you and I need to pray daily. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because his government needs to increase in our lives. His governing needs to increase in our life. He needs to be the governor. He needs to be the king. He needs to be the one in charge of our lives. By praying that prayer, Thy kingdom come and Thy will be done, what we're doing is recognizing that, Lord, I'm not in charge. You're in charge. Amen. That little song we used to sing in, in kids' church or in Sunday school, He's got the whole world. In His hands, He's got the whole world. In His hands, He's got the whole world. In His hands, He's got the whole world in His hands. Brothers and sisters, He's a big God. And He's in charge of everything. I mean, it ain't Father Time and Mother Earth. It's Heavenly Father, God Almighty. Amen? He's running this show. Amen. And when I say, Thy kingdom come, what I'm doing is I'm recognizing that He is in charge. You're not in charge. He's in charge. I'm not in charge. He's in charge. Amen. Glory to God. His governing needs to increase in my life. Jesus... I, I just write, wrote this down as a question. Is Jesus Lord and King? Or is He just Savior and friend? A lot of people want a Savior and a friend. But not many people want a Lord and King. Somebody say amen now. Amen. Where, you can speak out here. Amen. Listen, listen. Please hear me. I sometimes feel like a salesman. You know... Oh, if you come to Jesus, look what's behind door two. You've got peace forevermore. And, and, and oh, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have any hesitation at all saying to someone, if you give your life to Jesus, I can guarantee you things are going to get better. Because I believe that with all my heart. I believe that with everything in me. If you will commit your life to Jesus, things will be better. Because the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. But his yoke is easy. And his burden light. And in his presence is fullness of joy. And oh, if I could tell you, amen, being right with God, there's nothing that beats it. There's nothing that compares to it. Amen, there's nothing that you can equate to it. To know that your sins are forgiven and you're in right standing with God, it brings a good life. And the more that you can develop the relationship with the Lord, oh, things are going to be better. But there will come a time, as in any relationship, that the Lord is going to ask you to do some things that you're not going to want to do. Now, Frank and Cheryl, y'all are such good examples. Look at Sister Cheryl. She's got her hand up on his shoulder. 
I mean, just like she adores him. Just like... <laughs> I mean, they're sitting here, they're just looking like they're just the perfect picture of a wonderful marriage and that they've never had a fuss in their lives, never had a, never had a crossword. Brother Frank told me about how he met her. He was working down and down, and she worked across the street, and he was whistle at her when she walked by and uh, aggravated her. And, uh, I mean, he had just, it was kind of catcalling, you know. He was just whistling at her, hey, good looking, you know, kind of thing. And, uh, and it just got to bugging her, and finally she went out with him. And look at here, all these years later. Hey, don't you dare think for a second that it's been just peace and harmony the whole way through. There are several bumps. Because any relationship where you take two wheels, two separate wheels of people, and you put them together, we're going to have conflict eventually. Amen. Now, I would love to stand up here and tell you that it's always easy. But I'd be lying to you if I did that. Sometimes it takes anguish for you to submit yourself to the will of the Lord. But let me just let me give you a little precursor before I say anything else and just tell you maintaining the relationship with Jesus is worth it. Whatever you have to go through and whatever changes you have to make to, to, to keep that relationship good is worth the sacrifice that you will make. Amen. Because let, let, let me just give you, just let me just brag on him just a minute. He's big. And he's good. And he's got the keys to everything. Everything. And he can, he, he can make for the best life for you. So don't be like, like Saul. Don't be kicking against the pricks. You know what the pricks are? It's this little goading that the preacher does from time to time. That's a prick. Oh, I didn't want him to talk about that subject. I didn't want him to say anything about that. Oh, it made me uncomfortable. Hey, don't kick against that. If it's in the Word of God, then just say, Oh, Lord, help me to change. Help me to change. Because I don't want just you to be Savior and friend. I want you to be Lord and King of my life. I want to rule and reign with you one day. That's good. That's good preaching right there. He needs to not only be increasing in His governance in my life, but He needs to be increasing in my thoughts. Philippians 2 and 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We should begin to want to think like Jesus Christ thinks about things. We should want to make the same judgments about things that Jesus makes. We should begin to want to have the same temperament about things that Jesus has about things. We should want the world view that Jesus would have. You say, well, Brother Gary, did he have a worldview? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yes, he had a worldview. He had a worldview when he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He had a worldview when he said, Father, I've not lost one that you gave me. He had a worldview when he said, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He had a worldview. You and I are supposed to have a worldview, a Christian worldview, a Christ-like worldview. Our thoughts need to be, He needs to increase in our thoughts. Not only in, in, in type of thoughts, but in quantity of thoughts. We need to think more about Jesus. Think more about Jesus. That's the reason that Brother Thomas said, in the morning, amen, ask God for wisdom. Put God at the first of every day and say, Lord, help me today to think thoughts that would be about you today, about your purposes today, about what your will is today, about what your desires are today for this day. And when you do that, God begins to unfold things. I told you Friday night about the man that I made the delivery to on Friday. An excavating company, a man owned an excavating company up in Black Forest. And... Uh, 
he, he, you know, he got up there. He was waving me down, pull over here and dump it here and what all, and got up on my truck and. And I, I just began to talk to him about the Lord and, and told him that I was a preacher and, and that I loved Jesus and, 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 and what all. And, and by the time I got done, he had shaken my hand three times and told me, man, I'm glad I met you. I hope I didn't cuss too much when we are talking together. I mean, and, and, but, but you see, if I wouldn't have been thinking about Jesus, Brother Chris, I'd have missed that opportunity. But because my mind was upon Jesus, I was looking for that little crack where I could speak up for Jesus. Amen. He needs to increase in my thoughts. How many times can you go through a whole day and then think at the end of the day, did I talk to anybody? Did I pray for anybody? Did I read any Bible today? Did I, did I think about anything spiritual today? He needs to begin to increase in our thoughts. Ain't a, ain't a whole lot of amens, but this is good preaching right here. He must increase, but I must decrease. We're moving right along here. And the third thing is, I said number one, he needs to increase in his governance. Number two, he needs to increase in my thoughts. And number three, he needs to increase in my consideration. We need to be considerate of other people. Hey, hey you men, let me speak to the men right here. You know, Chivalry is almost dead. I opened the door for a lady one time and it offended her that I opened the door for her. Now, do I get mad at that and say, you feminazi, I, yeah, that'd be the last time I open a door for another woman? No. Absolutely not. I'm not going to let her problem become my problem. Men ought to be gentlemen. Amen. Amen. If you see a woman, hold the door open for her. If she's got a problem with it, it's her problem. I've seen Brother Frank do this. Brother Frank, he now, now listen, if Brother Frank ever holds the door open for you, you better say thank you. <laughs> That's a pet peeve of his. He don't mind doing a, 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 a good deed for you, but you need, to, you need to acknowledge it. Amen. Or we're fixing to give you a little lesson about life. When people do nice things for you, you're supposed to be grateful. And I say amen to it, Brother Frank. Amen to it. Amen to it. Hey, we, we ought to be considerate of other people. If you see someone struggling to load their, their, their groceries in the car, I helped, I helped a lady load some groceries about three weeks ago. An elderly lady, she was trying to get some groceries in the car. And I, I said, let me, let me help you that, that. Hey, we ought to be considered. When you see the needs of people, when you see people are struggling, it'll be something in your life that you'll be considerate of them. Amen. You don't just pass on by. You, you, you stop and you, you be considerate of other people. But you know, when it comes to Jesus Christ, we should be considerate of Him. What does He want? What would He like? You know, years and years ago, preachers used to preach about this. When you sit down to watch something on TV, you need to sit Jesus right down beside you and say, Lord... Are you happy about watching this? Is this something that interests you? I, I heard a guy say one time, well, I won't go into all that. That's, that's, a, little too, that's a little too tough. I don't know if y'all can handle that or not. I don't know if you can handle that, that or not. Okay, you asked me to. Guy, guy was knocking on doors, witnesses. Jack Howells, who it was, he's knocking on doors. And uh, he said to some people, he said, hey, would you mind if me and my girlfriend come in and commit fornication in y'all's bedroom? And the guy said, oh, no. He said, well, you do that every night when you watch them on TV do it. <laughs> Consider it. Hey, we should be begin to be considerate of what Jesus would want for our eyes to see, for our ears to hear, for our lips to speak. Amen? What does Jesus want? Does He have an opinion about what we're doing, this activity that we're participating in? Does Jesus have, a, uh, does Jesus have an opinion about it? He has an opinion about some things. And His opinion, we need to be, increase our consideration of Jesus. And then fourthly, 
we need to increase our heart toward Him. Into my heart, into my heart. We used to sing the song, Lord Jesus, come in today, come in to stay. Into my heart. Amen. You remember the story that Jesus talked about the, the woman that had the, the, uh, the demons that was cast out and then the house was swept and garnished? But because they didn't fill it with anything, then the demons come back and they brought seven more with them? Hey, it's not good enough to get the house clean. Oh, Lord, forgive me of my sins today. God, forgive me of my sins. He wipes the sins away. He's cleaning the house. But we've got to fill the house with something. Amen? Amen. And we need to fill it with Him. He wants to take up residence. Monique, you want in your life. He wants to, to come in and set up house. Amen. In my heart, we sang today, in my heart there rings a melody. Rings a melody. Hey, you know how the you know how the house is going to have a melody ringing in it when Jesus lives there. Amen. I've been I've been pastoring Charles here. He called me a couple times a week. We we talk on the phone and and he asks what about this and what about that and and I'm spoon feeding him what I'm giving you a shovel full of today. Amen. Hey, Jesus wants to live in here. Amen. He, he don't want to just come and give you a bath. He wants to take up residence in your life. Amen. Oh, in your marriage. He would like to be your, your marriage counselor. Hallelujah. He wants to make you the employee of the month on your job. Amen. Jesus wants to be a part of everything in your life. He needs to increase, and I need to decrease. Is anybody getting any of this? Now, the second part of the message is I must decrease. And I've only got one point in this, so him increasing was the most of the message, so don't nobody get nervous. I must decrease. Jesus demonstrated this in Philippians 2, in verse 7, when he said, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross Jesus demonstrated what it means to, to put oneself beneath you see he was the king of the universe he ruled in heaven before he came and walked on earth he, he was made a little lower than the angels by the Chris and his feet were dusty and his bones ached. He was born in a stable to lowly common people. And he said, let this mind be in you which was also in Jesus Christ who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Could I just tell you the greatest honor you, you will ever, ever, ever be a part of in this life is when you serve. Because at that moment, you're being more like Christ than at any other time. You see, I stand up here before you today, and it still baffles my mind why that any of you would even want to come and listen to anything I had to say. It really does. I don't know why. But I stand up here before you today, and somebody would say, Oh, I want to be up there preaching. I want to be up there This is the least. I mean, it, it don't even measure on the scale. This is the least of what a preacher does. When you, when you can serve, that's, the, that's where the honor is in life. Amen. I, uh, well... I'm, I'm going to put my notes aside for a second. I, I had Brother William go get me this stuff because I want to demonstrate this to you. We're going to have a little uh, illustrated sermon here, okay? What we've got here is a cup and some water. And uh, 
we're going to say that this is your life right here. And your life before Jesus came in was full of all kinds of stuff. And you see that? It's full. It's pretty full. Your schedule was full of stuff. Your dreams, your ambitions, your job, your family, your life was full. You weren't empty. You was cumbered about with much serving and busy, busy, busy. But here's what the problem was. Your heart kept draining out. Your bucket had a hole in it, so to speak. And you kept wondering, well, why am I sad today? Why is trouble always coming my way? And your ability to love and care and feel just kept getting used up by people and used up by people. Until finally, you looked and you said, man, I ain't got much left. How in the world? What in the world's happened to me? And then somebody came by and told you that, you know, hey, this life is a, it's an emptiness that comes with it. And you just get, you get used up and there's no way to refill it. And so people that stay empty too long, they become skeptical and hardened and what all. And you say, oh, that don't want, I don't want that to be me. And I've done many things wrong. And somebody said, well, here's what you need to do. You need to repent of your sins and let Jesus Christ come into your life. And you said, boy, that sounds like a pretty good deal. I'll take a little of that. And so you asked him to come in and, whew, I felt better. I hadn't felt this way in a long time. Man, the life, life has come back in me. And I have a, I have a new la- la- lease on life. And, and, and I don't feel guilt anymore. And I feel happy. And we live along there for a ways and things are good. But lo and behold... Life just keeps on happening and somebody comes and they cut you off in traffic and made you mad and you cussed them out again. And then you felt bad again. You said, oh God, please forgive me. And then we, we, we come and we repent and we, we get full back up a little bit. And so we live in this cycle right here. You've got you to stay with me right here. This is where most Christian, Christians live. This is the way they live their Christian life right here. Up a little, down a little. Up a little, down a little. Up a little, down a little. What the preacher's talking to you today about is why don't you let God start to take over your job, your marriage, your finances, your interests, your dreams, and fill you to the brim to where you're overflowing. That's what the Lord wants to do. Hey, But listen to me, that right there is a way better place to live than right there. Amen? And and, and notice something, the more I put Jesus into it, self just has to leave. Because there's no room for self left. So the people that are always trying, well, I need to do better. I'm going to try to do better. I'm going to try to do better. And oh, I felt bad about that. I'm going to try to do better. You can't live a Christian life just trying to fix the, the flaws in your life. You've got to, fill, the, you got to fill, the, fill your life with Jesus. The Bible says, be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So the more good you put in, the evil has to dissipate. Brothers and sisters, there's another place that you can be. You see, it's one thing to be full, to overflowing. But it's a whole other place to be, to be baptized and totally submersed in. Somebody needs, to, somebody needs to get on board here. It don't matter. It don't matter how you go. If you go in empty, if you get baptized, you most get full, overflowing, and totally submerged in. Hallelujah. That's the reason the Bible talks about 
being baptized of the Holy Ghost. And the initial physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Ghost is when you speak in other tongues. And the reason is, is in James, the Bible says that the tongue is the most unruly member in your body. Did you know your tongue is more unruly than your hand? Dan, let me see your hand. That's a good looking working hand right there. That hand right there, pretty unruly. <laughs> But you know, it ain't near as unruly as your tongue is. Your tongue is the hardest thing to control about your whole body. Have you ever said anything and, and when the words came out, you were trying to grab them? I have said, uh, you know, hey, I wish you could stand up in front of a group of people and preach for 30 years. You're going to say some dumb things, you're going to quote, misquote statistics. I remember one, one night I was preaching, I got excited, and I said, man, I'm sweating like a stuck hog. And a man at the back of the service, he said, Brother Gary, he said, pigs don't sweat. And I said, that's what you got out of the message? <laughs> he didn't hear anything else I said. Boy, he caught me in a, in a misquote right there, Brother, Brother Josh, and he was going to let me know about it. But the tongue, it's an unruly member. And when you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, your tongue is the last thing to go under. It's the last thing to go under. Billy at work the other day, he said, my girlfriend's trying to get me to go to church and she's a Pentecostal. I said, well, that's what we are. He looked at me and said, y'all are weird. He said, do you speak in tongues? I said, only when the Spirit moves on me. What I should have said is not nearly enough. Because the Apostle Paul said, I pray in the Holy Ghost more than y'all. Now in a public setting, preaching, God gave, God gave instruction in the New Testament. He'd, Paul said, I'd rather say five words that could be understood than 10,000 words that couldn't be understood. So I don't, I'm not speaking in tongues, preaching. But when I get to praying and the Spirit comes on me, you know, the, the, the Spirit comes in levels. Brother Thomas said it today. We felt His presence. We were just around His presence. We, could, we, we sensed that He was near. And there was a level of the Spirit inside of us because we were worshiping God. We were praising God. But what we need to do is go on through to that point to where we can be totally put under. He needs to increase and I need to decrease. I mean, the times that I have had the best experiences in my entire life was when I was in His presence. Hey, and listen, friends. A lot of people don't even talk about the Holy Ghost anymore because they think, well, you're going to run people off. They're going to think you're idiots. They're going to think you're weird. Because most people, all they, know about Holy, all they know about Pentecost is what they've seen on TV. And I just want to be the first to stand up and say that is not a true rep representation of what real Pentecost is. God is not going to get you up here, make a fool of you, and then you're going to go out and get a Rolls Royce next week. Because it seems like the Pentecostal people on TV, they've somehow equated that the baptism of the Holy Ghost is somehow the same as prosperity. And that is, that is so not true. If that is true, we're going to have to apologize to all the apostles who died a martyr's death. And they never had wealth and fame. And, and, and I mean, we're going to have to apologize to all the New Testament first, Christian, first century Christians that was burned at the stake and fed the lions. And they, hey, it's not going to be easy always to be a full blown Christian. But I can tell you assuredly. We get submerged in the Spirit and we empty it out of ourselves. God wants to dwell in us. Bodily, He wants to dwell in us. In other words, He wants to speak through you. Oh, hallelujah, I feel His presence right now on me. Listen, when, when, when Dan calls and says, Hey, 
or I call them and say, man, I was praying for you this week. I was thinking about you. You know what, Dan? I believe that the Lord is speaking to you whenever I speak that. Because that encouragement that I, I'm trying to give you, that, that comes through, that doesn't come natural from me. Guys don't talk to guys like that. But God wants to speak through you. He wants to use your hands to lift up the hurting. He wants to use you. But He's got to increase. And we've got to decrease. It can't be all you and all Him because there's only so much oxygen in the room. Amen? Amen. I know that this is not a shouting message, but I, I'm trying my best to communicate to you. If you would let Jesus take the, the first chair. I took band in the seventh grade. I played a saxophone. It was hideous. <laughs> it was hideous. There was about 60 kids in our, in our class, in our band class. And uh, I tried. I made it my aim. I want to be first chair one time. I never made it. I never made it. <laughs> They'd give me that sheet music to go home. and Oh, my mom and dad, God has got to give them a reward in heaven for listening to all that. I don't have the patience for it. My kids, I, I just don't have the patience for it. That's why I play the drums, because it's a lot easier to beat on something. But first chair, what a coveted thing. And what we would do in band class is they'd get around there, and it would give us, the teacher would you know, call us up, the band instructor would call us up and set us in front of the class and say, okay, play it, play, the, play your sheet. And we'd all go through, and she would judge which one did the best. And oh, it was humiliating. It was so humiliating. <laughs> but I had to go to the end of the line <laughs> on a pretty regular basis. And it seemed like that the ones that won first chair, they won it all the time. It was like you wanted to take their instrument and just beat it, you know. Jealousy. Hey, let's put Jesus at, at, the, at the first chair. Amen. Let, let's, get, let's give him the place of preeminence in our lives. Stand with me if you would. I, I did go.